everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jamie Lee and I'm a mixed media artist with an interest in true crime and the paranormal. To that end, I have a series of weird art videos here on my channel about haunted art, art and true crime, and more in addition to more traditional art videos. If that all sounds interesting to you, I'd love it if you'd hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. Today's video is a weird art video and it's a crazy one for sure. Up until about two weeks ago, I had never heard of the story I'll be covering today. Even though it involves America's most well-known and beloved architect, who is in fact one of history's most well-known architects, Frank Lloyd Wright. To refresh your memory a bit, Frank Lloyd Wright was alive from 1867 to 1959. He designed more than a thousand structures over 70 years. And the reason he became so well known was because he took architecture in a whole new direction and designed some of the most iconic buildings in the world. What was different about Wright's ideas for the time he created in was that he believed in designing in harmony with humanity and with the environment. Something that was new and refreshing and made him incredibly sought after. He is well known for starting the Prairie School architecture movement and he designed everything from family homes to skyscrapers. Some of the buildings he designed that you may recognize are Tokyo Japan's Imperial Hotel unfortunately torn down in 1968, Private Residence Falling Water, <laughs> the Guggenheim Museum, Oklahoma's The Price Tower, and dozens of private homes, most in Oak Park, Illinois, where Wright designed and lived in his own family home there for about 20 years. So far, this is the standard info that you usually see in history books and classes when learning about historical figures, right? Interesting, but boring and not very human, well. I'm about to change all of that. Remember first that from 1898 to about 1909, Frank Lloyd Wright did the whole regular American life thing. He married Catherine Lee Tobin, nicknamed Kitty, in 1898. He worked as an architect, first at other firms, and then opened his own. He and Kitty settled down in a home he designed and built in Oak Park. They had six children together. His whole life was in Oak Park. He was a husband, a father, and a respected and talented architect. He frequently had guests in his home, hosted parties, and designed homes for his neighbors. On the surface, everything appeared completely normal. Unfortunately, it was all a veneer. Let's take a little peek into the future for a moment. Picture Frank Lloyd Wright walking down a road in Spring Green, Wisconsin, at dusk, next to a horse and wagon, pulling a white, pine casket. It's now 1914, August. Earlier that day, Frank had spent time cutting heaps of flowers planted at a home he had designed and built on a hilltop and named Taliesin. Now those flowers were in the casket along with the remains of the woman who planted them, Mema Luton Borthwick Cheney. The wagon was heading toward Unity Chapel, where workmen had earlier dug a deep grave near where other members of Frank's family were buried. When they reached the gravesite, Frank's son John helped him lift the casket into the ground. And then at Frank's request, everyone left. He wanted to fill the grave himself, and he got to work with his shovel, loading the hole with dirt until it was dark and rain began to fall. Who was this woman that Frank insisted on burying himself? It wasn't his wife Kitty. In fact, this woman in the casket was one of the biggest scandals in Frank Lloyd Wright's life, and her death was his life's most horrific tragedy. Mama had been murdered at her home with Frank, Taliesin, along with six other people, including her own two small children. It was and remains the deadliest single killer rampage in Wisconsin's history. Frank met Mama while living in Oak Park, Illinois, where Mama was also living with her family. At the time they met, possibly around 1903, Frank was a preferred architect for homes in the area. So it was no surprise that Edwin Cheney asked Frank Lloyd Wright to design a house for him and his family his wife Martha, nicknamed Mama, and children, John and Martha. And at first, that is just what Frank did drafted plans for the Cheney house. 
but when he caught sight of Mrs. Cheney, something started that would forever alter his life. One sad fact is that Mama and Kitty had originally belonged to the same women's club and knew each other before the meeting of Frank and Mama. But unfortunately, when Frank spent time around Mama, he realized how very different she was from his wife, Kitty. Kitty was a devoted wife and mother to her six children. She concerned herself with her home and her family and was very happy in the life she lived with Frank in Oak Park. Frank? was a different story. He had played the doting father and husband role for a while now, but it seemed he was becoming more and more stifled, trapped, and unhappy in the life he'd built. As a husband, he was critical about how his young, pretty wife had turned matronly after bearing six of his children. His children were noisy and always underfoot, which grated on him because eventually he built a studio at his home, so he worked from home and his kids were always around. And kind of like an actor who always gets typecast, Frank was starting to feel penned in by the very movement he'd created, the Prairie School style. All of these occurrences, his dissatisfaction, and his googly eyes for Mama soon came to a head. For Mama was so different from Kitty. She was a feminist and an intellectual, and was steadily working on translating the work of Swedish feminist and writer Ellen Kay, a task she undertook until her death a little over 10 years later. She had outside-the-box thoughts on love, sex, and family. She was described by many as a disinterested mother, something Frank appreciated since I guess he couldn't escape from his family. Sometime after he began creating the Cheney home, it was common to see Frank driving the Yellow Devil. His 45 horsepower Stoddard Dayton sports car, painted yellow with brown seats and brass trim, Frank would wear a linen duster and driving goggles and speed around Oak Park upwards of 60 miles an hour with Mama in the passenger seat. This caused a scandal like no other. Folks in Oak Park and beyond frowned heavily on infidelity and Frank seemed especially hypocritical when many of his designs up to this point were meant to make personal homes family focused and help promote family values and togetherness. Yeah, I know. An even bigger scandal was coming though when Frank, seemingly out of nowhere, deserted his wife and six children and hopped on a boat to Europe with, you guessed it, Mamachini. Newspapers and neighbors couldn't get enough of this news. Pastors and preachers created whole sermons based on the sins of Frank Lloyd Wright. Kitty was devastated and the children were just confused. Frank took off out of the up until recently happy home, telling his oldest son he was the man of the house and leaving him with a $900 grocery bill. See, Here's another thing about Frank Lloyd Wright that history has washed aside. Many, many writings and first-hand accounts do not paint Frank in the kindest light. Sure, he was described as gregarious and talented, and he had an almost unnatural ability to get people he's wronged back in his good graces, but he was also selfish, terrible with money, felt he was owed because of his status of a premier architect and had a knack for wriggling himself out of tight spots with angry friends, family, and acquaintances without a second thought as to how they might feel. So now it's 1909 and Frank is in Europe with Mama. He is working too, but also completely wrapped up in his relationship with Mama. Many sources claim he was obsessed with her and she was equally obsessed with him. While in Europe, she works on getting a divorce from Edwin, who seems to be strangely okay with things. Kitty, however, was another story entirely. She was adamant that she was not going to grant Frank a divorce and was convinced that this was just a fling and he would be back with his family and they would be able to just pick up right where they left off. Frank did briefly return to Oak Park while Mama remained in Europe and it wasn't because of a lover's spat or because he was going to give his marriage one last try, although Kitty desperately hoped that was the case. No, it is believed that his return to Oak Park was very calculated. He was giving Mama a chance to be away from Edwin long enough to allow them to divorce on the grounds of her desertion of her family and also to convince his mother, Anna, to purchase a plot of land in Wisconsin 
Wisconsin, where he had grown up and where Anna's family was based. He, being short on cash as always, needed to borrow money to design a home for him and Mama, but he didn't want to say it was for him and Mama. So what better way to get the money than to pretend and look the part of contrite husband to the man he hoped to borrow the money from and say he wanted to do something sweet and innocent like build a home for his aging mother. Of course, as soon as he had the cash and the home was built, he fled Oak Park, had Mema return from Europe, and both of them moved into their new home, Taliesin, somewhere around 1911. The townsfolk around Spring Green, above which Frank's new 37,000 square foot home looked down upon, were not happy. In fact, for a time, they even tried to convince the local authorities to go to Taliesin and forcibly remove Frank and Mama, an occurrence that never happened, since they weren't technically breaking any laws, just moral ones. So the townsfolk would just have to be happy with spreading angry gossip about town which they did frequently. The press, again, had a field day with the news that Frank Lloyd Wright was living in a specially designed mansion with his illicit lover and took to publishing frequent articles criticizing Frank Lloyd Wright and referring to the love castle or the bungalow of love, always mentioning the jilted Kitty and Edwin, casting them as sad pawns in the story of Devil May Care, Frank and Mama, a characterization that was honestly pretty true. Frank and Mama didn't care. Kitty refusing to divorce him was just a thorn in his side, an obstacle on the path to him being with his soulmate. And until he could get Kitty to agree to the divorce, he was just gonna do what he wanted anyway. By the summer of 1914, much of the talk about Frank and Mama had died down around Spring Green. It was still there, just not so blatant. The press had pretty much moved on to other things. Frank was again working on commissions, Mama was translating, and they lived fairly calmly at Taliesin. Then came the unusually hot Saturday, August 15th, 1914. One of a string of hot summer days. Frank had gone a few days before to work in Chicago on his current huge project, Midway Gardens. Mama had her children, John, age 12, and Martha, age 8, visiting her at Taliesin. Daily workers and handymen who were employed at Taliesin went about their business like they did any other day. But today, today would be very different. Mama had decided that her, John, and Martha would eat on the screened-in porch that day, hoping to catch a breeze that would lessen the heat. The workers on hand that day were to take their lunch in another part of Taliesin, what was originally intended to be a sitting room for Anna, Frank's mother, when it was thought that she would have living quarters at Taliesin. Instead, the space was used for the workers to eat, and it was located a good 80 to 90 feet away from the terrace or screened-in porch where Mama and her children were eating. These men eating lunch in the workers' dining room were Tom Brunker, 66, a handyman and foreman who was father to 10 children, Billy Weston, 35, and his 13-year-old son, Ernest, who had been biking four miles from home to Taliesin every day to work as Billy was Wright's favorite carpenter and had actually built a large portion of Taliesin. Emile Brodel, an architectural draftsman about age 30 who was engaged to be married, Herbert Fritz, another draftsman around 20 years old, and David Limblom in his 40s or 50s who was a landscape gardener. These men were all seated in the makeshift dining room ready to eat while husband and wife team Gertrude and Julian Carlton got ready to serve the food. The Carltons were the only black folks at Taliesin and in fact probably the only ones for miles around. Gertrude was the cook and had been making the lunch soup this day and her husband Julian was a slash handyman butler. Many accounts say the Carltons were from Barbados but like much of this part of the story, published accounts were often wildly speculative and flat out untrue. Newspaper accounts at the time and the story retold over the years have often included a host of erroneous misinformation that became fact, but in fact isn't. 
So a little side note here, I read probably 25 blogs and articles about Taliesin researching this story. And while most of them got most of the information right, I would say every one of them got something wrong. So to tell this part of the story, I am relying on the book Death in a Prairie House, a detailed and well-researched book by William R. Drennan. The facts presented here are the most accurate I found, and that's what I will use to present the details of this horrifying afternoon to you. So back to the Carltons. It's likely that they may have told somebody that they were from Barbados, but in actuality they were probably from Alabama. They came to Taliesin by way of Chicago where they had worked for a friend of Frank's who recommended the pair to him. They had only worked at Taliesin a few months and were due to head back to Chicago that day actually to look for new employment. This is one part of the story that is often reported wrong and I'm going with the information that was in Drennan's book. Many articles and published accounts tried to say the parting of the Carltons and Taliesin was an angry one, but there's actually no evidence that this was true. It is often used to justify the events that happened on the 15th, angry, just fired help, takes revenge, etc. But they were not fired by Mema. They were not accused of doing a poor job. In fact, both Wright and Mema had stated on record that the Carltons were hardworking and intelligent. Julian Carlton did get into some scuffles with the other workers, especially Emile Burdell, but other than that they simply did their jobs. However, over the course of the month of August, Gertrude had begun to worry about her husband quite a bit actually. He was becoming incredibly paranoid and most nights started sleeping with a hatchet and a bag by the bed. She said she would wake up in the night to find Julian sitting by the window of their room staring out into the darkness. She knew something was up with her husband but she wasn't sure what. Then on the 15th, as she was making soup in the kitchen, Julian came in and told Gertrude to get her things and go. She was a little confused. They were leaving today, but not this early, but she did as she was told and left the estate. Now, as a warning, this is a content warning, this is the part of the video where things become quite graphic. If you would like to skip this part, I will leave a timestamp here for you. Just head there to resume the story without the horror bits. So as you recall, the workmen are in their dining room waiting for their lunch. Mema and her children are in the terrace waiting for their lunch. Gertrude has left the kitchen, left the pot of soup there. So now Julian, he took the three bowls of soup for Mema, Martha, and John to the screened porch. He set the bowls in front of each of them and then he hesitated behind Mema as she bowed her head to take her first sip. As she did so, Julian Carlton took a hatchet he had carried hidden and brought it down on Mema's head, cutting her skull wide open. Blood went everywhere. She fell face first into her soup and then slipped to the side. John was next. Carlton hit him with the hatchet in the forehead and killed him instantly. Eight-year-old Martha had just watched this man kill her mother and her brother right in front of her and she jumped up and fled in terror to the courtyard. Carlton pursued her and once he caught up to her he hit her repeatedly with the hatchet in the head. He assumed she was dead when she slid to the ground but sadly she was not not yet. With that part of his plan complete, he made his way to the workers' dining room, pausing outside to make sure the gas he had taken earlier under the guise of cleaning a soiled rug was still in pails outside the dining room. He had also taken time earlier to go around and make sure all the windows and one door was locked. So then he headed to the kitchen to get the pot of soup and brought it in the room as the men sat at their tables chatting. He served each man their bowl of soup and then left by the same door he came in. Side note here, nobody knows if he removed his white serving coat or if he served the soup covered in blood splatter and no one noticed. He closed the door behind him when he was done serving and then locked it from the outside. Inside, the men began to eat, oblivious that anything odd was going on, until Herbert Fritz noticed a wash of liquid entering the room from under the closed door. At first he thought it might be water from an overturned cleaning pail until it reached his table and he smelled the distinctive smell of gasoline. On the other side of the door, 
Carlton had taken out his smoking pipe and clamped it in his teeth. Now he lit his pipe with a match and threw the lit match down into the gasoline. The gasoline exploded into flame and suddenly in mere seconds the dining room and the people inside were engulfed in the flames. The men desperately tried to escape but Julian's plan worked at first. They could not open any door or window. Herbert Fritz made a split-second decision while his fellow workers banged at the door, all of them burning. He threw himself against a window that shattered and let him through. From there he rolled toward the river below and looked up at the burning room where he watched as Julian came around as the other men desperate tried to escape out the windows. As they did, a worse fate awaited them. Julian, now aware he wasn't going to be able to keep them in the locked room, waited by the window with his hatchet. Herbert watched from halfway down to the river in horror as Emile Brodel escaped through a window and was promptly the victim of a hatchet to the head. Julian then rounded back to the door as the men inside broke it down and hit each man in the head as they exited the room. Billy and Tom were hit with the back side of the hatchet and were injured but remained alive. 13-year-old Ernest and gardener David Limblom were not so lucky. And then after Julian finished them, he again went to Tom and finished him off with a forceful blow to the head with the correct side of the hatchet. By this point, Herbert had made it back up the hill from his fall, burned and injured, and saw Julian kill Tom and then collapsed himself. Julian he wasn't done though. He grabbed one bucket of gasoline, went to the screened porch, and lit it on fire with Mama and John's bodies inside. Then he returned to the courtyard where he possibly lit Martha's body on fire, maybe realizing that she was still alive, despite having three hatchet blows to the back of her head, one blow under her eye. Then Julian left the courtyard with burning bodies and building all around him and headed for a hiding spot where he could wait out the fire, the building's furnace. He later stated that if he wasn't found, he had hidden clothes out in the forest to put on at nightfall. Or if he was found, he had insurance in his pocket, a bottle of muriatic or hydrochloric acid that he had purchased earlier that week. He still held the bloody hatchet as he made his way to the furnace room. The home that Frank Lloyd Wright had built for himself and a soulmate now stood burning, and almost everyone who was there that day was burning too. A mother and her children lay dead. A carpenter's son lay dead. Three of the workers, though, managed to stay alive despite burns and head injuries. Billy Weston, David Limblom, and Herbert Fritz. Billy roused himself and managed to realize that David was still alive too. Imagine the horror he must have felt checking the burning hatchet injured bodies for signs of life, his own 13 year old son included, and then having the fortitude to get David and head half a mile away to the nearest place with a working phone, the Ryder home. Once at the neighbor's home, the call was sounded to authorities and townsfolk alike. Soon law enforcement and curious or helpful people from the town made their way to Taliesin. Fire had to be put out first, and then came the task of locating the dead bodies. It was Frank Lloyd Wright's brother-in-law who found Mama and John in the terrace area. Mama badly burned and John, well, John was completely gone save for some ashes. On the property of Taliesin was a small residence called Tanny Dairy, and once all the bodies had been located and brought to the courtyard, a plan was made to bring them all to Tanny Dairy to prepare them for their final journeys. At about 1 p.m., Frank Lloyd Wright, working at Midway Gardens in Chicago with his son John, received a phone call and left the room where they were working on a mural to take the phone call. He returned shortly and John didn't take notice at first, but then realized that his father was strangely quiet. He became concerned when he realized that his father was white-faced and leaning on a table for support. A fire at Taliesin, he managed to get out, and John swiftly arranged for a taxi to the train station. Here we arrive at the day I spoke of before, where Frank picked great armfuls of flowers Mama had planted to blanket her coffin with, walked with her casket to the cemetery, and filled in her grave himself, shovelful by shovelful. Later that same day, Julian Carlton was found by authorities hiding in the furnace, having gone with plan B and drinking the muriatic acid once he knew men were coming for him. The sheriff quickly got him in a police vehicle and headed for Dodgeville Prison 
followed most of the way heavily by several posses of men who hoped the sheriff would let them deal with Carlton in their own way, most likely by lynching. Instead, Carlton sat in jail and authorities tried to prepare for a trial and figure out why. Why? Julian Carlton did what he did. Theories floated around, like I said, many wildly speculative, but untrue. Mrs. Carlton was found and held in jail for a while where she told authorities about Julian's increasing paranoid behavior and his spats with a few of the workers. It was determined that Mrs. Carlton likely didn't have a hand in any of Julian's actions, so she was released and put on a train back to Chicago, where strangely she was never seen or heard from again. Julian lived for seven and a half weeks incarcerated, where authorities just couldn't get a good explanation out of him. Despite published reports, he didn't die because he couldn't eat. He had swallowed enough acid to mess him up, but not kill him. And he was technically still able to eat, but even so, he actually died of starvation. Unfortunately, he did die and took the reason for this horrific massacre with him. Although, according to Drennan's book, the most likely motive, and the one supported by evidence, was that Julian and worker Emile Burdell had a major feud going on that escalated. Julian, already seemingly suffering from mental issues in the weeks leading up to the massacre, according to his wife Gertrude, decided to get revenge on Emil for treating him badly and possibly calling him racial slurs. In Julian's mind, he had to remove all potential witnesses, which explains why he attempted to kill everyone at Taliesin. It was all obviously premeditated, and at one point it appears Julian was pretty sure he would be able to hide escape at night, change his clothes, and disappear. In short, he fully expected to get away with it. Frank Lloyd Wright was forever changed by the events at Taliesin that day, but even his dealings with the aftermath were a little odd. For one, he rebuilt Taliesin right away, claiming he was doing so as a tribute to Mema. But he found a new love interest less than a year later, and was eventually married twice more in his lifetime. The second one, a terrible and toxic union that basically made his life a living hell for 15 or so years, and then, third time's a charm, he married Oglavana, whom he was with the remainder of his life until his death in 1959. His career took off even more forcefully after 1914, and he helped solidify himself as one of the most well-known and respected architects in American history. Yet, he was never the same architect as he was before Taliesin. His designs from 1914 on were much more insular, secluded, and protective. He developed a major fear of fire destroying things, and in fact was plagued by fire for the remainder of his life. He built a second Taliesin, Taliesin West in Scottsdale, Arizona, and rebuilt the original Taliesin again after rebuilding it from the massacre fire, after the second version again burned to the ground due to faulty wiring. It seems that the trauma of losing Mema was too much for Frank Lloyd Wright to think about much, as even he admitted that soon after her death, he began forgetting much of her and their time together, until it was almost as though she never existed. But he never got over her murder or Mema herself. He just let her exist in his own memories, like a ghost. In fact, even though he remarried twice, and talked little about Mema to people in his life, after her death, his wishes were to be buried beside the grave he filled in himself at Unity Chapel 45 years before, once he passed away at age 92. In fact, his own funeral included his casket being pulled to the cemetery in a horse-drawn wagon filled with flowers, and his grave is still there next to Mema for eternity. However, Frank Lloyd Wright's body isn't in it. In another weird turn in the legacy of Frank Lloyd Wright, in 1985, his grave was dug up, his body cremated, fire again, and his remains sent to Taliesin West in Arizona to be kept next to his third wife, Ogivana's ashes. Maybe this is why Mema is allegedly restless? That's right, what kind of weird art video would this be? If I didn't mention that, according to many accounts, Mema may have never left Taliesin. Remember that cottage where the bodies were brought on that first day, Tanny Dairy? Well, it seems that once Mema was taken there, she may have never left. Multiple people over the years have reported seeing a woman figure in a long white dress, 
about the property, looking restless and lost. Also, workers there report strange happenings. More than once, employees have closed and locked all the doors and windows at night before leaving, only to return in the morning to find them all open. Lights are said to turn themselves on and off, windows open and close by themselves, and doors slam. Also, people report hearing children talking and they smell smoke and gasoline. And that is the end of this story as we know it. Many people only think of Frank Lloyd Wright as some brilliant and mythical historical figure. However, as with most people in history, Frank was all too human. And his choices throughout his life caused him much pain and suffering. Even in death, he was eventually ripped away from his soulmate, Mema, against his wishes. And it seems like their story will forever be remembered as a great American tragedy. I'd love to hear what you all think of this story. Have you ever heard of Taliesin or the massacre that occurred there? Isn't it strange how such a horrific and well-known event can be just lost to time? Anyway, that's it for me today. I hope you're having a great one, and if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I would also love it if you want to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos like this one. I will see you in my next video. Bye! Alright, Stell. I'm making a video. You, you gotta lay down, cause that's what you do. You lay behind me and snore, and I make a video. Remember? You're not sticking to the script, Stella. <laughs> and took to bar. Buh. <laughs> Oh, glib. Oh, why is that coming down? That's weird.